So as I've already said, I was gonna do my annual sermon on capitalism today, on money and how important it is to so many of us, whether we have too much of it or too little of it or none of it, unemployed, overemployed, underextended, overextended. I'm not gonna do that. Um, because the events of this week are so overwhelming that I've got to try to not say too much about them. No promises, but shift of subject. And I'm sorry that the hymns and the text and the service won't align the way it normally does. But maybe that's the point. Maybe a lot of things are out of line and out of alignment. So the text is about how manna is enough for us, but we don't know it. We want something else. It's a pretty strong message, and it makes us feel bad because really the question is, why can't we be happy with what we have? But we aren't, and we can't, and we're not alone. Even people way back then wondered why they didn't have the melons that they used to have or the onions that they used to have. And they apply nostalgia to their past. Remember, it used to be so good, how good it was before we had to confront the truth about police violence and about guns and about people killing each other. Remember how good it was back then when we didn't know what some people knew, and now we know it, and we can't stop knowing it. Violence and violence and more violence and seemingly unending violence, how can we speak of anything else? The gun violence may be the cherry on the top of the economic banana split, but it hurts the most and keeps the rest looking mighty pretty when it's not. Let's start with the obvious. Black lives matter. Black lives matter. Blue lives matter. Blue lives matter. Life matters. Feel your heart. It matters that it's beating right now. It matters. And some hearts aren't beating today. By chance, by design, by what and why. No one deserves to wake up in the morning and worry that a gun is going to interrupt his or her afternoon. No one. So let's try to talk about how you and I can connect to this catastrophe in American society. The catastrophe of guns, the catastrophe of, the catastrophe of hate, the catastrophe of fear, the catastrophe of racism, and about the way we who are the richest people in the world don't know how to be satisfied. Man is all there, but couldn't somebody get us something we would like to eat? So Norman Lear, who was about to turn 93, was asked how he had made it so long and so well. And he responded by knowing the difference between what is over and what is next. I thought that was a great sound bite. Is the season of our discontent over or is it just starting? Will Dallas be the last in a string that might have started with Newtown or Orlando or Charleston or St. Paul or Baltimore or that great town in Colorado named for a flower? 
took me a while to remember it. It's Columbine. When did the string start? And when will it stop? And if it's not going to stop, what's next? How can anything be next if we're not over with something else? See, some things go on and on and on and on and on. Children were murdered in a school. Churchgoers were murdered at Bible study. Dancers were murdered while dancing. French partiers were shot up in a cafe bar. Part of what's going on in this season of catastrophic discontent, not the normal kind where you just wish you had something better than manna to eat. You know, that normal, existential, human, universal, I don't have enough. Now, it's like what we don't have is bothering so, so much we couldn't possibly look at what's next. We have lost our sense of continuity and can't seem to figure out what's over or what is next. We can't find the dawn or the dusk, the horizon or the hem. We are unhemmed. It's like strings are hanging out at the bottom of our clothing. Our slips are showing. We are falling apart. We are lost. Ross Duthat this morning said that the center doesn't hold. He was slouching towards meaning, and he said, is it all really unraveled? And he wasn't kidding. So at the very moment that the Dallas news was breaking on Thursday night, I had recent, received an email from one of my favorite people, Tay Ravez. Many of you know her as a significant community organizer, a mature person organizer in New York City, runs an organization called Global Reach. And I always open her emails as soon as they come in because she always has good ideas. And I opened this one and she didn't know, she had sent it before the Dallas tragedies. And the email said, Dear Donna, can we do something about the five terrorist incidents around the world last week? And then she named the cities. Could we do something? And can we talk about doing something on your front steps? And I read it, and this was before Dallas, and I said, Hell no. Enough of that. Enough vigils. Enough prayer services, enough, enough already. And I wasn't talking about the manna enough. I was talking about her words. Is there some way we can show our sympathy and solidarity with the hundreds of civilians and security personnel who were killed and wounded over the last few days in Ankara, Baghdad, Dhaka, Medina. No. <laughs> there is nothing we can do to memorialize anymore. Enough vigils. So what's over? Gun violence isn't over. And terrorism is not over. If anything, it's probably just beginning. I wish I didn't think that. I wish I didn't see that. But it would be phony and false and insincere to say that somehow it's going to be over. It could be that it's just beginning. So I want to speak to us as beginners in the 21st century. And as beginners, people who might have to learn how to be interrupted. <laughs> there is a God, I feel better already. <laughs> oh, that's great. 
of people who are going to have to figure out how to be interrupted and disrupted. Oh, gosh. So in my vigil exhaustion and self-protecting cynicism, I remembered Margaret Sanger, who reportedly stood on the steps of Judson Memorial Church, where we have all of our vigils, where we seem to vigil every couple of days now, in 1929, and she read a letter that she had written to the Attorney General of the State of New York. It informed him that she was going to begin to distribute birth control in the State of New York, which was illegal. And he, she wanted him to be the first to know. Sanger exemplifies what we beginners do know, but need to learn even better. She had great organization. She had great movement and she had great courage, and she made sure that the people in charge knew what she was doing. Guns, you see, are over. Spiritually, they're over. They are over. But the politicians haven't caught up yet. In the same way that the politicians had not caught up to Margaret Sanger's movement, which became Planned Parenthood, in the same way that the right to marry for all people became real when the electorate was convinced that it was time. We got the people and then the politicians heard us, the courts heard us and caught up. In 1929, you couldn't talk, say the word birth control. Now you can say the word birth control. And even the Supreme Court allows you to use it. I got this notion of the beginner's beginner from a moth radio story. Maybe some of you heard it. Uh, a woman who is 75 uh, wanted to go dancing and couldn't find her husband, who was a great dancer, had died. And so she went to various senior citizen centers, started learning how to dance again uh, with people who weren't as good as she was at dancing. And then one day she saw a sign out in front of uh, the senior center that said you could learn a special kind of dance here. And it was for beginners who were beginners. And it was called the BBs, the Beginners Beginners Dance Class. And she learned how to do the tango and performed in Spain two years later in an American dancing contest. The beginner's beginner is where we are on our way to next. Because all the things that are going on, the way people hate each other and don't trust each other and don't know how to trust each other and know that the ladder is broken, all of these things we're in elementary school, if not kindergarten, about right now. So we'll become beginners beginners and confess that we are. So a final word on manna that comes from my favorite comedian, David Barry, who writes books about Florida. And you all may know him, but he wrote a great book about manna. And in this context, manna could be considered political power or agency or hope or capacity. It's lying all around us on the ground, ready to be picked up. Why would we need anything but what is there? We have the power. Anyway, David, Dave Barry was a major in English at Haverford College, where he claimed to have written lengthy scholarly papers filled with sentences that even he did not understand. He, his favorite title, which goes to Manna, is this one, Babies and Other Hazards of Sex how to make a tiny person in only nine months with tools you probably have around the home. <laughs> Mana, power, resources, love, forgiveness, 
capacity, regenerativity, hope, democracy. They're tools we have lying all around the home. Let's use them. Tay, my friend, I'm sorry, I just can't pull together another rally. But I am rallying energy as a beginner's beginner's beginner. To do what I can with what I got, and I notice the manna everywhere. Amen.